Today's scripture reading in God's Word is Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You love those who love you. What reward will you <coughs> get? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So be it. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. You are a wonderful, mighty, holy, loving God beyond any of comprehension that you would choose to love us. Oh, how majestic is your name. Lord, help us today through your spirit to just get a glimpse of your glory, Lord, so that we can live a life that brings glory and honor to you, that we don't take for granted this precious gift of salvation that came at the cost of your son but that we work out our salvation in fear and trembling and that we aren't hypocrites, but that we are a light to this world drawing others. Father, we thank you for this body. We thank you for your spirit that indwells us. Open our eyes and ears, Lord, to be more like Jesus. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. So I entitled this Loving Like Jesus. Last week we talked about the fact that you are an overcomer. Simply, period, you are if you believe and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything. There's no works of righteousness that you have to do or anything else. You should do things, don't get me wrong in saying that. But because of your faith, you can have peace that you have overcome death, that you have overcome the world, the prince and power of this world, you don't have anything to fear. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, period. But now that doesn't mean we stop there and that we're satisfied with that. That means that we are ki ki children of the kingdom of heaven. And since we are an overcomer, we should live like an overcomer. No sports hero that gets rewarded for everything then goes and lives a life and, and doesn't do that. He lives as a champion, right? We are overcomers. And I mentioned how Jesus proved his love for us and how we should prove our love for Jesus. And Jesus gave us the standard even to love the Lord your God with all of your mind, soul, strength, body, everything about you, everything in you, in your soul, spirit, mind, everything, and to love others as you love yourself and as Christ loved them. And last week, our scripture from 1 John 5 was this, because John writes that letter to the church reminding them many years later that they need to live a life of love. He's got past that point of wanting to rain down fire on people. He wants to love people even if it costs him. And he writes the church in 1 John 5, starting in verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, they have been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of Him. By this we know that we love the children by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome because everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. Who then overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So if you believe that, you are an overcomer. But you are also called to live a life of holiness and called to show love for God and for your fellow man. 
Just saying that you love without actions, James says that is dead. And let me tie this together there. Then you're not really an overcomer, are you? And isn't the thing that's important to you that you'll spend an eternity with God? We won't mention the opposite of that. But don't you want to spend an eternity with the one who created you, loved you enough to do that, loved you enough to redeem you back by the blood of his precious son? Don't you want to spend an eternity with the one that loves you that much? If you're an overcomer, then you need to show your love for God by loving him and by loving others. You are an overcomer. So this week we're going to talk about loving in word and in action. Jesus is the reason that we know God, that we have fellowship with Him. So how did Jesus love? And He gave up heaven, He gave up everything, came to the world that He created, had to be raised by human beings, and then He lived a life showing us how to live. He didn't think of His own, He thought of others more than His own. He didn't have a place to lay His head. And then He laid down His life. Not for his good buddies that were there to back him up, but for those that had betrayed him and left him, and even for his enemies. He was spit upon, mocked, crucified. And we're coming up to Easter, and I hope you're thinking about that. Because Easter, Christmas is great, don't get me wrong, don't throw anything. Because Jesus came and was born, but he came born to die. Because how much God loves you. And we're coming up to Easter and the, and the passion of Christ. And then the empty grave. <laughs> that you and I know that death has no sting. That there's nothing in this world that has power or control over us. So we need to live like an overcomer. Jesus taught us how to live. He showed us how to live when he was living. And he showed us how to live in dying because of how much He loved us. That proves to us that God loves us, even while we're still enemies. Jesus gave up everything. So here's the question. As a follower of Jesus Christ, are you willing to give up everything for your love for Him? A Christian is called to do that. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. You can't look back once that you have got that information and put your hand on the plow and look back longingly at the world because if you do that, you don't deserve the kingdom of heaven. If you don't keep Jesus' commands and love the Lord your God and love others, then probably your faith is not genuine and you will not overcome. Jesus gave up everything because of His love for us and we deserve the exact opposite. Now, when we want to complain and fuss about other people, we want to complain because they've done this or that, and especially if they've done it to us. But it doesn't matter what they've done, we're called to love. Now, that doesn't mean you stay in an abusive relationship or anything like that. Don't take and twist the Scriptures. It means that you're called to love. The, the disciples even asked, how many times should I forgive? And they were blown away by, by Jesus' answer to continue to forgive just as your heavenly Father forgives you. Think about the Lord's Prayer. It's right there. That we're supposed to forgive so that our heavenly Father forgives us to forgive in the same manner. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of forgiveness. So I'm thankful for that and I don't want to take it for granted. We did nothing to deserve God's love and grace, but He poured it out on us lavishly. Love is not a feeling not this special feeling, and I think that's the deception that, that the devil does with so many of our words. Because if you look at the definition of love or you ask people, it's a feeling I get because of how someone treats me. Well, the problem with that is then I don't want to love when I don't get the, the emotions and the things back to me. I want to do the opposite. I want to hate. Correct? And that, let's call it what it is, is sin. That's not from our Heavenly Father. We're called to love because God is love and God first loved us. So I have to let the Spirit transform my mind constantly so that I'm not wanting to 
hate and be prideful and envious and lustful and everything else. But instead, I want to be forgiving and kind and loving, even to my enemies. I was thinking about that before I came up here. Never once in Scripture does Jesus go back and say, Hey, I've had enough of this. <laughs> Boy, I've done that plenty of times. What's today? <laughs> We are commanded to love as God loved us. If that's a feeling, it's the exact opposite of what my human nature wants to feel. So I need to have my mind and my spirit transformed to be more like Christ. I have to deny myself. I have to die to myself. I have to understand that if it takes up suffering and dying, that, that I'm called to do that, and the prize if I'm running the race, is worth so much more than any of the things along the way. Does it really matter that I got my feelings hurt or if I even got physically hurt? Does it matter if it cost me my life? It cost my Savior my life, His life. And He did it while I was His enemy. While I didn't understand, nor did I care. He loved me because He is love and wants a relationship with me. So love is something that we do even to our enemies, and we do it in action, not just word. So there's a problem here. Any of you know what it is? <laughs> Me. Oh, you'll hear plenty of things about you. got to love yourself, and I'm not trying to degrade that either. But the problem is, is I love myself too much, and that's a problem with most of you. Because we want our way. When we don't get our way, we don't get the feelings we want, everything else, and that's when we start... Sinning. We sure aren't loving as Jesus loved. Now, yes, you are valuable and beloved by God. You're special. He formed you in your mother's womb. He, you were created. He, Jesus died for you. You are God's masterpiece to do good works. Don't forget that in Ephesians 2.10. As He planned and ordained from the beginning of time. Because you are His child. You are an overcomer. So what we have to learn, and it's hard sometimes, and it takes giving in, put, you know, kneeling at the feet of Jesus at the cross so that he can change us, is to give up our self-love so that we can give selfless love because that's the example that Jesus Christ gave for us. We wouldn't know God's love if we didn't see it in the, the human form of Jesus Christ who gave up everything, including his life, to die for those who could not care less. Matter of fact, they, want, they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Let's release a known instigator and possibly a murderer instead because we despise this man so much who has done nothing but good. We fight a spiritual battle, and we will honor and serve one king or the other. I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose King Jesus. And it takes a daily dying to myself so that I can love him the way that I should and love others the way that I should. In Luke 10, we get that little example of the Good Samaritan. Starting in verse 25, One day an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's your question again. If you want to know where your eternal destination lies, here is the question. Whether you're an overcomer or you're not going to overcome. And Jesus says to him, what is written in the law, in the Old Testament? How do you read it? Do you read it as a bunch of regulations? Do you read it as a, as a wrathful, consuming God? Or do you see God's love in it and a call for a holy people who are constantly stiff-necked and disobey God, but yet he still is faithful, patient, loving, and kind with them. And it doesn't change his plan that he's going to send his son to die for them. And now we're to that point in history. The man answered, It's love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. To which Jesus responded in verse 28, You have answered correctly. But they didn't stop. he didn't stop there. Jesus said, do this and you will live. Now here, there's the problem again, isn't it? I know what I should do. And over here's what I should do. 
Now, where am I at in this picture? I'll stand here, but I probably should be over here, right? Because I know the truth. I know all those things that I struggle with that Jesus teaches. And you know, when I do die to myself and do them a little bit more, there is more freedom. There is more peace. There is more joy. When I stop thinking about myself so much and thinking about others. And why would I not want to? Why would I care what somebody did to me if I can love them back and love covers a multitude of sin and it brings them to the realization that God loves them? And they come to a saving experience, born-again experience through Jesus Christ. What would it matter what I've been persecuted or not? Or what it cost me or not? Is the eternal security of someone else, especially someone you love, is it not worth more than anything? Don't build up treasures here on earth where moths destroy and thieves come in and steal, but build up treasures in heaven, those things that are eternal. Because where your heart is focused, that's where your love will be. There's where you'll spend your time and your passion. There's where your thoughts will be, everything else. If you really, truly value the love that God has given you through Jesus Christ. Verse 29, but wanting to justify himself though, and I do that quite often myself, because I love myself too much, he asked, who is my neighbor then? So Jesus took up the question and said this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of the robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the same road, but when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So too, when a Levite came to that spot and saw him, he passed by, the, by on the other side. But when a Samaritan on the journey came up to him, he looked at him and had compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he said, and on my return I will pay you for any additional expense. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Now, we've gone over this story many times, and I will many more times as long as I have breath. <laughs> I want to just focus on one thing here today, and that's where it says, The Samaritan looked at him and had compassion. Why? Why would he? The man was more than likely a uh, person from Judea compared to Samaria. That meant they were enemies. That meant that they despised each other. Think about that. Why would I have compassion on that person if I don't get past my own physical pride and sin in my life? They got what they deserved, didn't they? I... I I'm a, I'm a righteous person, aren't I? I don't know what happened with the, the Levite and the priest. But why would I want to have compassion on that guy who speaks slanderous things about me, who does things to me to hurt me? Compassion. That's not just love, but that's pity for the condition that you're in. And if God didn't have pity for you in the condition that you're in, dying in your sin and your shame, then he would have never, ever sent his son to die for you. But he had compassion for you. And we should have compassion even for our enemies. That compassion is what drove him to do something. And it cost him. Other Samaritans probably ridiculed him and everything else, but he was driven by compassion to do something which cost him now the end of this section of scripture the man answers the one who showed mercy he knows the answer but what are you going to do with that answer are you going to get off your high horse a little bit and do something even if it costs you or you can continue to know the law but not live by the law Jesus replied, go and do likewise. You can't come to church, you can't read your Bible, you can't pray, and then not have compassion 
on someone else. And in this case, even your enemy. Now you can take this scripture and put it all everywhere you want to about loving your neighbor and everything else. But the point that I want to make today, and it's here in scripture, is that this person who didn't have a right relationship with Jesus still had compassion and loved like Jesus. If that person lived that way, how should you and I live? Shouldn't our tendency to do compassionate things come even quicker? Even if the cost is greater? Because our debts to God have been paid. He took His wrath out on His Son so He wouldn't have to take it out on you. Shouldn't we do loving acts of kindness to draw the world to Jesus Christ? Especially in this day and age, but also especially in the freedom that we still have in this country. I said before, my problem is I love myself too much. And that is why I fail constantly at the first commandment and the second commandment. And I will, I just like Paul, I will continue to do the things that I choose not to do, but I will continue to repent just like David and say, God, I sinned against you and only you. Please forgive me. Please teach me. Please mold me. Show me these opportunities and help me to deny myself so that I can help others. If I love my neighbor as much as myself, then how differently would my life look? Love is what motivates us to doing things even for our enemies, even if it means sacrifices, which is what overcomers must do. It's how the kingdom children are to live. It's how we will live eternally in God's kingdom. Why would we not live that way now? You are an overcomer if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus referred here to the law. He referred to the Old Testament. So let's go back to the Old Testament a minute and see what it says exactly. I'm going to go from Leviticus, but you can go to many different points. In Leviticus 19, it's written in verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the whole congregation of Israel and tell them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. I'm dropping down to verse 11. You must not. These are the things that we concentrate on. I, can't, I, can't, I, I don't need to do this. But let's concentrate on doing the opposite of this as kingdom children. Because we already know that we shouldn't be mean and ugly to somebody. We struggle with this love your enemy. <laughs> right? We already know we're not supposed to do this. If we, if we not, aren't doing this because we realize we're overcomers and we're living like Jesus, then maybe it'll be a little bit easier to do this, which is how we should be in the first place. This is exactly what Jesus is telling us. You must not steal. You must not lie or deceive one another. You must not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of, of your God. I am the Lord. You must not defraud your neighbor or rob him. You must not withhold until morning the wages due a hired hand. You must not curse the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You must not pervert justice. You must not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the rich. You are to judge your neighbor fairly. You must not go, go about spreading slander among the, your people. You must not endanger the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You must not harbor hatred against your brother in your heart. Directly rebuke your neighbor so that you will not incur guilt on account of him. Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against any of of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. These are the things that we would tend to do if we loved ourselves too much. Verse 33 When a foreigner resides with you in your land, you must not oppress him. You must treat the foreigner living among you as a native born and love him as yourself. For you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now I know this man, this religious expert of the law knew these things that day and he's probably remembering these because he's almost quoting this word for word but summing it up in I am to live this way not just know this law but live this way but yet justifying himself he said this is exactly what I do I know the law but I'm not going to live this way 
And Jesus has to show him how a Samaritan, the foreigner, shows love when he is not familiar with the law and doesn't think he's righteous and doesn't think too much of himself but thinks about someone else, even his enemy, with compassion and then acts upon it. Not just says, oh yeah, somebody should help them, but he's the one that takes the time out of his schedule, the money out of his pocket, and helps the man. This is a way that we can be selfless in our love instead of selfish in our love. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love one another deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love is so much stronger than the sin, the hatred, the envy, the broken relationships that are in our life that we, well, I'm not going to do this because this person did this to me. But love covers a multitude of sins. Love lets them know that you are a child of God because there's no other way that explains how you can love an enemy, especially how you can do compassionate things for your enemy. Selfless love actually draws people to God. Imagine that. Paul wrote this in Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from His love, any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, if you have any of these things, and there's compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love. Now that puts us together as a church, that we all feel this way. So collectively, we're driven to doing compassionate things. Now think about how different the church will look in the community. Don't go taking other churches and saying, oh, comparing yourself, compare yourself to how you should act to Jesus in what he said here today in his story about the Good Samaritan. Are we as a church doing that? Do nothing, verse 3, out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility considers others more important than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Not telling you to take every dime you have, although Jesus had a story about that too when he said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. But he's emphasizing here, Paul, is that if you take care of yourself, why in the world wouldn't you take care of the other person that had a need? Why would you not do that? It may just be, as Jesus said this too, about a rich man whose life was required of him that night. It may just be that God gave you the things that he had so you can help take care of others. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ Jesus that would compel him to lay down his life for us. Verse 6, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even a horrific death on a cross. Shameful The Son of God was whipped, beaten, spit upon, mocked for people who were His enemies. Now, if that's not an act of compassion, then I don't know what is. And Jesus said, No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for his friends even. And Jesus did it for His enemies to show us the way. Verse 14 of Philippians chapter 2, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine as lights in the world, as you hold forth the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain that we live just like Jesus lived, just like Jesus commanded, that we are lights in this world, even in a perverse and crooked world. 
Don't be surprised if the world hates you. If you're a disciple following after Jesus, it might just mean that you'll be mocked upon, spit upon, and even martyred. But you would run your life, you would run this way, race, knowing that you have overcome this world. And guess what? Shine your light to others so maybe they'll overcome this world also. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul wrote, Do everything in love. Now I said before, there's nothing wrong with loving yourself, but the question is, do you love God enough to empty yourself so that you can love others more than yourself? Can you give up your selfish love to have selfless love? Are you willing to let the Spirit transform you? You know, that means like a butterfly. The word is, a, is a, uh, the same word used in metamorphosis where a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Now, it would be just wonderful and dandy if the caterpillar just turned into a butterfly, wouldn't it? But he's got to go through or she's got to go through that transformation. And it's a literal dying. It takes effort to transform into something that is so radically different. Jesus Christ <laughs> lived a life that was radically different. And He's called you and I to do the same. But the only way to do that is to go through that transformation, to let the Spirit transform you so that you are like Christ for all eternity, but don't miss the part that you're like Christ in this world, letting your love cover a multitude of sins and showing others the way. I can't think of anything better than to know that because I live my life so much for Christ, despite what other people thought, that there would be several, many, some, whatever, that saw the light and came to salvation. If there was one, would it not be worth it? But if the more we live our lives like Christ, think of the probabilities that there might be more than one. Oh, how I'd love to see my children and grandchildren and my friends and everything else come to Jesus. Nothing would I desire more than that. So why wouldn't I be willing to give up everything else in this world to help obtain that? Selfish, self-centered love being transformed into other-centered love. <laughs> Just like King Jesus. Paul writes this to Timothy. He could have wrote to all these different people, but he had one protege. He had Timothy, a young man that was following in his footsteps. While he's in prison, knowing he's going to die for preaching the gospel. He had been attempted to be murdered and had been in prison many times. And yet still he was faithful. And we have his works because he was in jail. And he writes to one young man and says this, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But understand this, in the last day terrible times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. The American dream, not to worship God in freedom, not persecution, but to accumulate as many toys as I can, to have as much freedom as I can, as many rights as I can. They, are, they will be lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love of good, traitorous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. They might look like they're righteous and holy, just like the man did that day, but if he didn't go and do likewise then he would have been far from the kingdom of God, wouldn't he? His question that he asked of how he may, must inherit eternal life would probably be pretty vain, wouldn't it? Because he wouldn't be an overcomer. Because he didn't put into practice everything that he knew that God's word said to do. He didn't understand God's love because he couldn't accept the fact that God would love him so much that he would send his one and only son to die for him that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but instead have eternal life. They have a form of godliness, but denying its power, because we are going to be transformed by the Spirit of God and live by the Spirit of God, if in fact we are children of God. 
Turn away from such as these. So instead of having a form of godliness, last week I read you from 1 John. I'm going to read you just a little bit of that as a reminder. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin, which is the hatred, the envy, the lust, the things opposite of loving as Christ loved, Everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness as well. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. But you know that Christ appeared to take away sins. In Him there is no sin. No one who remains in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the very start. This is why the Son of God was revealed, to destroy the works of the devil. Anyone born of God refuses to practice sin because God's seed abides in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has, he has been born of God. By this the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. That's in there. I didn't put it there, okay? Verse 11, this is a message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. That's why we went back to Leviticus. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Why? Because he thought more of himself. He had envy. He had pride. He had hatred rather than love for his physical brother, and he murdered him. And why did Cain slay him? Because his own deeds were evil. There's the problem. You have these things because you don't have the love of God in your heart. So you do hate. You do have envy. You do have thoughts that are bad about your brother, which Jesus said was just like murder. While those of his brother were righteous. In chapter 4, 1 John, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And love consists in this, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So I want to give you one more thing that Jesus said about loving. In Matthew 5, verse 38, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is harder, isn't it, Merle? <laughs> if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Boy, there's a lot of things I don't want to do. How about you guys? You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He is the one who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the, rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Instead, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The kind of love that we're to be known for. J Jesus told us that in John 13. A new commandment I give you to love one another. As I have loved you, so also you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples. And he repeats it. If you love one another. And then two chapters later in John 15 he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no, uh, no one than this, but to lay down his life for his friends. Selfless, not selfish, sacrificial love for others. Because you have the love of Jesus in your heart, and therefore you have compassion in your heart that leads to action. We read from 1 John earlier about Cain. And I'm going to read that and then I'm going to close. Verse 11, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We 
should love one another all throughout God's Word because He loves us. Even when we rebel, even when we don't want His love, even when we want to set up ourselves as our own gods, even when we want created things more than the Creator, even when we want to hate and destroy and kill our brother, God still loves us. And He showed us that love in the form of Jesus Christ, who gave up everything. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain. <laughs> Our first example outside of the garden to two children, and one kills the other. The actions that you're doing are either leading to murdering your brother by not being a light in this world and doing the things that Jesus has commanded you to do, or they're drawing your brother to eternal life. Maybe you don't agree with me, but that's the way I read it. You can't serve two masters. You can't ride the fence. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. And if you love Him, you will obey His commandments. And people will know that you are His disciples by the way you love one another. True love is the opposite of self-love. Self-love is unsatisfying. You'll long for everything in this world and you will never find true pleasure or happiness or contentment in it because it doesn't exist when you go after created things. Instead, live your life where you go after the Creator, the one who loved you enough to give His one and only Son for you. True love thinks of others more than themselves, even to the point of death. True love is generous, extravagant, lavish, and knows no bounds. It is eternal, not temporary. No one deserves it. No one deserves oxygen, is what I say a lot of times, because we sin against God. We deserve His wrath, and the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you give that kind of love that no one deserves, they can't deny it either. That kind of love covers a multitude of sins. That kind of love points to the fact that you are different even than other Christians. That you're like Christ who loved Himself enough to die for them. That's the kind of love that overcomes this world, that draws people to heaven. The kind of love that you and I are commanded to do individually and corporately. Why? Because Jesus loved us, plain and simple. Jesus told that man to go and do likewise. Father in heaven, we do thank you that Jesus would lay down his life, that he would not only teach us in his words and his actions, but that he would do the ultimate gift of love and that he would lay down his life, even when his disciples betrayed him, even when people spit and mocked upon him, even when it was so hard that he sweated drops of blood. He said, not his will, but your will, O God, because your ways are perfect and true. Your love is so lavish and extravagant. And Father, we thank you for pouring out your love to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, if we have chosen to believe, help us to believe this kind of love will help change the world, that it is your plan for us, that we are your children empowered by your Spirit to be like Christ in this world until he calls us home. And Father, we long for that day when Jesus Christ does return and we can see him face to face, the one who gave his life for us. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen.